Okay, I think we've got we've got a nice number. So good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to our latest ornamentals webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to David Tolbert from ADAS, who'll be taking a lead on today's webinar. But before I hand over, I'd just I'll just go through the housekeeping rules that you can see on your screen there. Um, so you're, you'll all be muted with your camera off so we can't see or hear you. Um, please do put any questions into the Q&A box that you'll be able to see if you um, move your cursor down to the bottom, towards the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A box. If you can put questions in there, then we'll pick up with those and we'll ask them as David's progressing through the webinar. Um, and I'll make an, an attempt to read the question out so you're all with us if you can't, aren't able to see the question. There's also a chat box. Please feel through free to put any other comments um, in there or queries and just to let you know it is a recorded session it'll be posted on our knowledge hub shortly afterwards um, so you can access it there and if you know of anybody else who hasn't been able to make this webinar um, then they can uh, re-watch it on that. Um, if you accidentally leave the webinar, we are aware that some people are having technical issues today because of the weather. Um, don't worry at all, you can click back on that same link and rejoin us. So, I'll, um, I will now hand over to you, David. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sarah. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, right, we'll get cracking. Today's webinar is looking at plant protection in ornamentals, how we use, how we do it, when we apply things and why we need to do this. So just a little bit about myself, um, some of you might not have uh, met me, albeit virtually before. Um, so I'm a horticulture consultant and I've been with ADAS for 13 years. And my day-to-day -day work is carrying out a mixture of research and grow consultancy on nurseries um, and that's really helping with pest disease and weed control in ornamental crops. Um, we did a previous webinar I suppose about six weeks ago now um, on integrated pest management um, which sort of is a useful thing to watch which sort of feeds into this webinar if you haven't seen that before and that's available on the Knowledge Hub of the Tuffy Cymru website so it'd be a useful watch if you missed that one. So, on to today's talk. Um, so, first of all, thinking about culture controls, um, vitally important. So, some basic stuff and some techniques you might not have thought about. Um, so, maintaining a dry regime is very useful to prevent diseases, um, particularly as we move into autumn and winter, as disease prevalence increases and Dry regime not only helps to control the foliar diseases such as detritus, but also root diseases such as pythiums, phytophoras. So if the media is very wet, they're predisposed to those root pathogens, which can cause reductions in growth and uh, of course losses. Um, another useful technique is minimizing leaf wetness, which gives the added benefit of reducing humidity within the crop. So Periods of leaf wetness, the general rule of thumb, the longer the period of leaf wetness, the higher the risk of foliar disease. And that applies both indoors and outdoors. Obviously, we have less control outdoors um, with the rain, but, but certainly if you can schedule your irrigation early in the morning, um, it's much better than putting it on just as you're getting dusk, particularly for the things that are prone to foliar diseases such as hebes with high risk of downy mildew. And then another technique for minimising this leaf wetness, particularly in the winter, is trying to look at the weather and plan your irrigation as part of your week. So getting it on on a bright sunny morning if you can to get those leaves dry and reduce the humidity within the crop. Another technique that's probably less well used is a product called anti-condens and this can be sprayed onto the inner surface of both 
glass houses and tunnels and that prevents condensation forming um, and disperses the condensation so it's less prone to dripping under the influence of gravity onto the crop which then contributes to leaf wetness so it's a useful product um, different product for use on plastic films and glass so just something to be aware of there so the right product for the right right job but something that you might look to have a go with if you haven't used those sorts of products before ventilation and fans are another useful technique they can help to drop both dry leaves and disperse humidity and if if you're looking to install fans the supplier of those should be able to help you place them in the right locations within the glass house or tunnel so you don't get pockets of dead sort of stale air that aren't getting moved by the fans if they're too far apart and fans can also be bought and these are ones to buy if you are looking for new ones with humidistats which you can set the point when the humidity reaches a certain point when you want the fan to kick out, kick in and that set point will be different at different temperatures but again the supplier should be able to provide guidance on that so they all help with air movement but if you haven't got fans and you're on a smaller scale you can make as much use of natural air movement as possible and even if you have got fans do make use of natural air movement so where possible <coughs> you want to have the vents fully open in the winter and the doors unless it's frosty so and even on a frosty morning when the sun's up and the risk of frost damage is gone it's good to get those doors and, and vents open and get get the air through and reduce the humidity disperse that stale air and that will all reduce your risk of botrytis and other pathogens developing and um, just looking at the picture there quickly useful to think about other techniques such as covering irrigation tanks that solves a lot of problems it saves leaves and rubbish growing in which eventually forms muck that needs clearing out but those leaves can also introduce pathogens such as pythium into your water source and then you can unbeknown to you be watering that pythium actually onto your crop so giving it a nice pathway into a crop um, also they prevent algae growing in tanks which save issues with filters and clogging and associated hassle um, preventing weed setting seed is, is another useful technique again fairly basic but each weed can produce many hundreds of seed depending on the species and they all contribute to weed pressure there was some research done in the usa a few years ago and that looked at regular hand weeding on sort of a weekly rotation and it carefully recorded the time spent to do that versus weeding periodically when you weeded every two or three months and removed every weed and the regular hand weeding this approach stopped the weed setting seed and actually proved to be much more cost effective and it also backs up any herbicides you're using so getting them out for a seeds the main message so thinking about how to use and apply biological controls and bioprotectants you may have heard the term biopesticides these have recently been named, renamed bioprotectants so sort of true traditional biocontrols of the predators that we perhaps used to using so things like parasitoids that are used for aphid control where you have a parasitic wasp and that actually lays an egg inside the aphid and causes it to turn into a mummy. Um, predatory mites, they use for various pests, um, things like two-spotted spider mite using Phytocelius, um, Ambrocelius species used for thrips, um, etc. And then other biological controls, we do actually apply nematodes as a drench for the, the control of vine weevil larvae within the growing wheat media. And this has become more mainstream because we've not really got any good chemical controls these days um, so that's the main line of attack and if done correctly it works very well so uh, useful techniques so we're because of changes in availability of pesticides we're 
like it or lump it, we're being forced down the biological approach. And it requires a little more attention to detail, but done right and properly, they can work very well. So thinking about bioprotectants, previously biopesticides, these are typically sprayed onto the foliage, um, as you would a normal conventional chemical spray. Ideally, you want a separate sprayer to apply these, and that's because it's very, very difficult to properly wash out a sprayer to remove any re residues. And if there are pesticide residues in that tank, it can potentially impact on the bioprotectant and reduce its efficacy. So, if you're not familiar with these bioprotectants, they're usually living things and you're applying spores in sort of a dormant stage and then you mix them with water and that brings them back to life and they're sprayed onto a crop and they grow over the surface of a leaf and that's how they work. Now depending on the size of a business it may not be feasible to have two separate sprayers so if that's not feasible we need to do the next best thing so that would be to run a tank cleaner their various products for this job to reduce as much to remove as much of that pesticide residue from the tank before putting your bioprotectant on and also useful to do that between different bioprotectants because some of them can sort of are, are not overly compatible so thinking about water volumes ideally apply these in two to four hundred liters a hectare unless the label specifies otherwise. Um, so water volumes is an interesting area to touch on. Historically we used to say apply in a thousand litres a hectare in ornamentals and some people were applying at much much higher volumes but that's found to be wasteful and not overly efficient. So it's a bit like getting in a bath and getting in an Olympic sized swimming pool Whichever one you get in, you're not going to get any wetter. And the same sort of applies to spraying crops. And actually, the more sp spray we put on to a higher water volume per hectare, the more risk you have of those spray droplets running together, which we call coalescing, and then they, they become under the influence of gravity and they'll drip off the crop. So, at higher water volumes, you generally get lower retention on the leaf. So it's useful to, to work at the lowest water volumes you can. And then by protectants, some of them have specific storage requirements, so various products, but just touching on one, which is pre-stop, which can be used um, as a foliar spray for botrytis and as a root drench for root diseases such as Phytophthora pythium. That one has a storage requirement below four degrees C, so that's in a refrigerator. So you'd need a special small, well, small fridge in your pesticide store to store that. Um, and you, it'd be well worth having a thermostat in that fridge so you can buy little fridge thermometers just to check that is at your target storage temperature. And just be aware these are living things, so we need to keep any moisture out of any opened or part used packs to keep them dormant and prevent them degrading in storage. So you'd want to steal, seal any of those packs, put them in a Tupperware container, and ideally any of those desiccant sachets that come in sort of when you buy a new pair of shoes are often in the box, worth saving those and using them for that job because they'll help draw any moisture that gets in the atmosphere when those boxes are opened. Okay, <clears throat> so thinking about conventional pesticides. So all the application research has been done on agricultural scale or largely done on agricultural scale application systems where boom-based systems are king really um, and that's because of the scale of the operation field scale booms. So if you are able to operate on a boom-based system, that's brilliant and that will give you best results. Uh, if you're not able to think, can I make changes? So um, people have modified a lance to put a small boom with three nozzles on. Um, 
so that's a way of getting around it. So just a point that handheld application is generally variable and that's because of human error. The main application method in most ornamental crops is through the use of a reaper spray pistol or similar and our wrist actions as we're applying those products can result in overlapping um, so some areas get high dose some areas get probably a substandard dose and this can be easily seen if you apply growth regulators and you haven't got it quite right so another thing with application with booms there's a big choice of nozzles that we can use so generally a flat fan nozzle so a 110 degree flat fan nozzle is a good choice for insecticides and fungicides and there's a classification for these nozzles by the British Crop Protection Council that's the BCPC abbreviated there and that gives each nozzle a spray quality so spray quality is classed as fine medium or coarse so generally the finer the spray quality the more prone that those small light droplets are to drift um, and the coarser the spray quality the less prone they are to drift so for most things so for fungicides insecticides i would go for a medium spray quality and for herbicides i'd go for a coarse spray quality and you obviously don't want herbicides to drift about um, you want them to land where you want them again sensible water volumes in the region of 200 to 400 litres a hectare some products or EAMUs specify otherwise now just flagging up EAMUs there in case any of you aren't familiar with those we can use products under extension of authorization for minor use um, and then another thing to think about when you're planning application always think when am I going to be putting my next round of irrigation on am I going to get the best bang for my buck out of this product so if it's a protective fungicide that you're putting on autumn winter when you may only be irrigating once a week or or thereabouts I would always try and get your irrigation on on a nice bright sunny day as we said earlier get the leaves dry and then go in with the protectant fungicide the next day because then that product will give you the best result by being retained on those leaves where you want it whereas if you don't plan your irrigation in and you end up having to irrigate a couple of days after you put that protectant fungicide on you're potentially washing a lot of that protection off and predisposing the crop to disease so just a bit of planning there so when to use cultural controls really they should be used all year round and they should always be at the forefront of your mind when you're making any crop management decisions so they're the starting point if you like so this picture on the right here we've got some conifers and if any of you are familiar with conifers they're fairly prone to root rots normally caused by pythians phytophthoras which do like wet conditions so if you can grow the crop on the drier side and if you've got control of water i.e they're in a tunnel um, that definitely helps but again the cultural control is the key so if you do find they get a bit wet for whatever reason backing off for water is an, a useful technique but if you do get any going off with root disease they will start to change color before they go as brown and dead as this um, and you'll see that so thinking about how the disease spreads so they swim any spores of these diseases swim out in the water so if you have had any losses it's definitely worth roguing those out and disposing of them before you put any irrigation onto that crop also you may have to put a fungicide drench on but that that's another thing sometimes you can control problems if you catch them early by by favoring the conditions for the plant rather than the pathogen so if you just get the odd using this conifer as an example if you just get the odd one starting to go off with root disease and they're on the wet side and you can drive drive them back rogue out any affected plants 
you may not need to put a fungicide drench on and that saves obviously fungicide cost um, a lot of time to apply it because generally fungicide drenches you put on it at 10% of a pot volume so they do take time to apply so thinking all the time favor the creating a favorable environment to favor the crop rather than the disease and this is vitally important in winter so moving on to biocontrols biological controls and bioprotectants so when when should you be using those so a good rule of thumb is from april from october particularly for predators and predators can be used for most problems really um, the likes of copper and syngenta byline have useful websites um, another one's biobest and there are biological solutions for a lot of problems there um, they do have a temperature requirement some of them so some of the aphid parasitoids they won't fly at low temperatures so you really want temperatures to be getting up to sort of 16 18 degrees um, within protected structures it's a big ask to try and use predators that fly outside but there's certainly potential to use predatory mites outside and some people are already doing that very successfully and with the, the reduction in chemical options they've been forced into that but they're actually getting far better control and it is a bit of a learning curve the first year but you soon get the hang of it and uh, a bit of support and it becomes almost like second nature really so another thing to think about some bioprotectants have minimum or optimum temperatures to colonize the leaves so bioprotectants that we apply as a spray generally colonize the leaves and they control the disease through a, a range of ways but important ways as out competing them for space and they'll also feed on leaf exudates which are on the surface of the leaves and that helps to prevent pathogens so one that's been about for a few years which we've been able to use this product called serenade aso which we can use under a extension of authorization for mine use eamu so just using that one as an example it can grow below temp uh, temperatures below 15 degrees but the optimum temperature is 25 to 35 so if you're thinking about using it thinking about when it will work best for you in your production cycle to get the best results so that helps to decide when to use it so then conventional pesticides still have their place so when when do we use those um, so really when pest disease pressure is high um, when other things may not have delivered the results we've hoped um, or when we've had hot spots of pests or disease that have developed quickly and we need to get things back into line so fungicides to protect crops against pathogens so prevention is still better than cure so we can use bioprotectants to protect crops at certain times of year but not all so fungicides still have a role to play and you can alternate bioprotectants with fungicides in spray programs to help reduce your reliance on conventional pesticides where where possible so thinking about why you might be interested in using cultural controls as we said prevention is always better than cure so if we prevent the problem that's great they help to save costs on both labor and crop inputs <clears throat> and they minimize disease pressure and prevent prevent us having to do as much control problems which can help to prevent fungicide resistance developing so fungicides are a little bit like antibiotics so if we keep using the same one again and again and again the pathogen or the pest has the ability to develop resistance and that means you'll get initially a proportion of a population that isn't controlled but if you keep using that same product you'll get more and more of a resistant population starting to dominate and 
you won't get the control you want. Now it's, it's important to prevent that happening because we haven't got that many good chemical controls these days and we need to preserve the ones we've got left and that's an important thing to do um, but there's the classification system that helps us to understand this so for instance with insecticides they, they've all got a frac group and that and the same with fungicides they've got a uh, sorry fungicides frac group um, insecticides IRAC group and these help because those with different groups you won't get resistance between the different groups they've got different numbers so but that's something I can help you with if, if people want to help with that after the webinar. So why should we be interested in using biological controls and bioprotectants? Again, the same mantra, prevention is better than cure. Um, so with biological controls, for aphid control, for instance, you'd be putting those in weekly from the risk period under protection, say from April through to October. Um, and the predators are always better than, at finding pests than us. Um, ultimately, their life depends on it and their life cycle. So they'll go and find the pests and hopefully control them before they become a problem. Also, predators can continue working in the retail environment. So, and the same with bioprotectants that are live on the leaf. So you're actually sending the product to the retail environment with some protection on there. Um, whereas if you've just been using conventional chemical products, yes, there might be a bit of residue that gives a little protection, but maybe not to the same degree. So I've had clients in particular that have sent products early season and they've gone into a, a warm retail environment and the crops had an explosion of aphids on there. So if they'd been using aphid parasitoids on that crop, it might have helped to prevent that in the retail environment. So just another tool. As we said, fewer conventional pesticides for control of key pests. Another important thing is biological controls and bioprotectants are safe to use and they're safe to your staff. You don't have to wear protective equipment to apply a lot of them maybe a bit different for some of the bioprotectors that we're spraying on um, and particularly if you're using application equipment that also is used to apply pesticides because there will be some residues coming through so it would still be wise to put a suit on but certainly with and gloves and wellies but certainly with the predators the predatory bugs there's no need to put protective equipment on there and with some of the very hot weather we've had recently it's far nicer staff putting out predators and getting into a, a rubber or plastic suit to go spraying in a glass house or tunnel. Um, also we've got limited controls for some disease so using every tool in the box really helps to preserve the remaining controls so keeping those chemical controls for when we really need them as our get out of jail cards if you like. If we overuse them, they may not work so well. So thinking why we use conventional pesticides. So reliable biological controls do not exist for every pest or disease problem that you might encounter. They do for a lot, but not everything. Um, cultural controls really help, but do not always prevent problems. So even with the best will in the world and cultural controls, environmental conditions can be conducive to an outbreak of powdery mildew, for instance, and you'll need to go in with a conventional pesticide to, to control that. If, even if you've got a, a fungicide program in place, you still need sometimes react and, and put additional sprays in. Um, sometimes you need just need that rapid cleanup prior to marketing just to clear up anything that's, that's cropped up. So just an example, daily is often prone to, to aphids 
low down in the canopy and uh, you don't all if they're grown in six packs in a bedding type situation it may they may not become apparent until the crop's been lifted or until just before the crop's been lifted so you need a product that will work quickly so something like gazelle sg would be a good product there gives a rapid knockdown is systemic and the product's clean going into store so these conventional pesticides are just sometimes needed to give that knockdown but they can also be used to give a knockdown prior to starting with biological controls again so when things get bad and you get a hot spot of pest activity you can pull them back with biological controls depending on the pest so things like spider mite that get away from you you can put a high rate of phytocedus in and they will control the problem but it's a numbers game and it's a, a judgment between the numbers that you've got and the numbers you've got to control whereas with aphids if they get away from you get a hot spot it becomes very expensive to try and do that biologically so a knockdown spray is the best option prior to starting again with your biological controls to prevent problems occurring. So just a bit of a, a flavour on how else Tuffy Cymru can help your business. So um, through the ornamentals programme of work that's ongoing that this is part of, there is the ability for people to have a one-to-one -one ornamentals consultancy on their nursery funded by the scheme so just to flag that up if that's of interest and if you if that is interesting or helpful to people if you get in touch with Sarah or Sam at Tubby Cymru they'll assist and make that happen really so um, I hope that's useful and if there are any questions be, be delighted to take them. Oh, thanks, David. That was very informative. Um, no questions at the moment. We'll just wait a couple of minutes just to um, just to see if anybody else wants to. Um... Yeah. OK, well, thank you all for attending. And thanks very much to David. That was really excellent. And as you said, if you if you want any further information, please do get in touch with us. If you want to access the one-to-one -one support or you'd like us to come out to your business and have a chat about what else Tubby can we can offer, then please get in touch. This webinar, um, as we said at the beginning, is recorded, so it'll be posted on the Knowledge Hub website in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. I hope the um, weather is cleared up in your area and you have a... Uh, more sunshiny afternoon and can get back out again when you when you leave this webinar there'll be a short evaluation form to complete we really appreciate it. if you could just it only takes a couple of minutes and it's always important to get your thoughts and feedback um, from the, the actual growers so thank you very much we'll say goodbye thank you bye